What's good, Coach? Yo, what up, what up? What's poppin'? Hey, man, first of all, I want to thank you, man, for the opportunity uh, for coming on, on the Ropes Boxing, man, to get the interview done. Yeah, I, really, I truly appreciate I'm it. I'm honored, man. On the Ropes Boxing, man, one of the leading boxing websites, man. I love really coming on your site, man, listening to you. You know what you're talking about. Oh, man, I truly appreciate it, man. I don't know if you know Rock Pitts, man. He got a son named Candyman. He's yes, he's the one who actually um, had me reach out to you, so I, I'm, I'm truly honored. Show. Yes, he went told me about the show, told me to watch it, and he and, and spoke very highly of you. And ever since then, I've been I started subscribing and watching, brother. And I'm excited to be on. Man, I truly appreciate it, man. Let's take it back. Let's go back to the early days of back in Philly, man. Your early childhood beginners in North Philly. Talk about that. I was I was raised Muslim. <clears throat> you know, I was raised my parents. I was raised. My dad was. And went to prison for murder. He changed his life. He was, uh, you know, a former gang member. He came to prison, changed his life. And he changed his life so much and gave his life to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, that he didn't give us his, his surname. His last name is still. He gave me Rahim. He gave me attributes of Allah. He said, Allah, I'm giving my children back to you. Forgive me for, for all my sins. And he, and, and he gave us his last name. My point of saying that is, him and my mom was married. He had six kids. They had us. The crack epidemic hit America in the 80s. I was born in 76. All I knew, my mom and my parents didn't allow us to, to associate with any children that was not Muslim. So you can imagine how sheltered we were. One day, my, my dad went out with my aunt. He come and he come back for an hour. We ain't seen him for two days. My mom trying to figure out what is it that's keeping you away. Next thing I know, she ain't come back. I got five, six brothers and sisters laying around hungry. Three days we ain't eat, freezing in Philadelphia. What I do? I strap on my coat, went to the post, the nearest grocery store. I was gonna steal some. We got to eat, starving. It's cold. I go into the grocery store. I seen a lady outside with bags. Something clicked in my head. I said, "Can I help you with your bags, ma'am, for fifty cents?" She started crying, gave me twenty dollars, and, and told me, "Come on, asking where I live at." And I didn't want to give her information. I don't want my mom and dad to go to jail. I don't want them to split us up. Not to mention that the, the crack, the addiction, but also racism at that time. So us going to the system at that time, man, would have been horrific for all of us. They would have broke us all up, and it would have been over. Make a long story short, man, that was the beginning of my drive. At twelve years old, and I, I went. I'll make a long story short. She gave me that money. I went in there, bought some eggs, milk, bread, cereal, took it home to my to my brothers and sisters. I was a hero. That never stopped. I continued to do that till I was thirty five years old. And so I realized, damn, they grown. Why I don't have to do that? It's not my job to to, to provide for them. I helped them. I said I got sisters. I sent them to college. And so I finally got married and realized, you know, damn, I, I got to think about me and my family. What, what do I want out of life? But let's rewind. When I was when I got to twelve years old, man, I, I, when I was eleven years old, I was in North Philadelphia fighting on the streets. My mom at two o'clock in the morning. I ended up chasing some guys off the block because I was hustling. I'm twelve years old. You imagine how you hustling at twelve? I got to eat. A young man was killed. You know, I got hit in the head with a bat. I always had them hands. I was out there fighting and I'm beating them up. And you know, I'm only twelve years old, man. Somebody hit me in the back of the head with a bat. My brothers was out there. Somebody gave my brother a knife and said they killed your brother. He started stabbing people. He killed somebody. He killed a young man that I went to school with at the time, actually. So, you know, my parents took us and moved us out of there. Quick. A whole other neighborhood. The next morning, the house was burned down. They arrested my sister for it. Make a long story short, the next year I was in Dublin, Ireland, fighting for the Junior Olympic Championship of the World. Never went back home. I went, I went to, got, a, got a scholarship to Northern Michigan University at 12 years old. For boxing. I went up there. I was leaving the college, going to a middle school. You know what's like an enemy? Marquette, Michigan? I can imagine why. Listen, I caught a Greyhound from Camden, New Jersey. I had to stop in five different states, probably 12 different cities with bags. I was probably 85 pounds. No cell phone. And it was a culture shop. They ain't drive cars up there. They drove snowmobiles. Freezing. I thought Philadelphia was cold. Mm. And you know what? At 13 years old, 4 o'clock in the morning, they had us getting up on jogging. And I'm in the woods 
running with guys who's in college, 20 years old, 22, I'm 13. And guess what? They leaving them. So what do you think that meant for me? I'm from the city. I don't deers and rabbits. We don't see that. I see rats and roaches and cats and dogs. That's what I see. That's it. We got concrete. We don't got no grass where I'm from. So now you dump me out there in the forest at 4 o'clock in the morning in the dark, and y'all running, leaving me? You talking about conditioning? Oh, yeah, it got up quick. Coaching them put me in any fight. It was a rat. I wasn't going past two rounds. I was an animal. I didn't want to get left in that forest. I was running with Vernon Forest. Matter of fact, you know Vernon Forest, 1932 Olympian? He was up there running with us, man. I mean, it was a slew of guys, you know what I mean? But I was a baby. I stayed up there, man, and continued training, going to the amateurs, going to the pros. You know what I mean? I'll meet you. You know, going back to what you were saying about the crack ep epidemic, you know, down here in D.C. during that time, you know, when it really hit hard was in the 80s and back in the middle 80s. That's when D.C. was known as the murder capital. Yeah. And it yeah, really I hit hard during, during the Rayful Edmund years, Wayne Perry years. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, and yeah. How, did, how did your neighborhood change during that time? And, and how did your parents get involved with that? My aunt introduced my dad to it. The, the crazy part about it, man, is my parents owned like, their own home. We lived across the street from a park in a middle-class section of Philadelphia. We, they was doing pretty good for themselves. But once they started doing that crack, man, it was different. It was a different life. We moved, we went... We lost the house, ended up moving to a shelter. My dad ended up going back to jail. We live in a shelter, five kids, my mom, and one room. You know what I mean? And down the street from this shelter was a was a horse stable. So what did I do? I'm a hustler. I go to the horse stable and start cleaning horse manure for money. And being in Philadelphia around that area, though, anyway, back to the question. I'm sorry. I read off of it. But it, it, it changed because I was sheltered. And when that crack epidemic hit, man, I was left in the, my, me and my, I had a little brother. We was in the middle of the streets, man, in a big city at two o'clock in the morning. I don't know where my parents at. We just looking around, walking around like, wow. Can you imagine being sheltered for so long and then let out in the wild like that? You see uh, drug dealers, pimps. I mean, you see all this crazy stuff, man. It's just unbelievable. I don't know. I just thank God I'm here alive today, brother. <laughs> I'll tell you that. You know, going back to that time, you, you talked about the, the tragedy uh, that happened to you at 11 years old uh, with the whole situation uh, with the murder. During that, during that time, how do you think your life would have changed if you would have stayed in that environment compared to leaving and going to Michigan during that time? Well, my life would have changed dramatically from a success to a failure. And I didn't want to be a failure no more. I, I know when I went to school, when that crack epidemic hit and I went to school, I can immediately identify the other children whose parents was on crack. I can tell the way they look, the way they talk, the way they dress, and I became friends with them. Because we were an eyeball. We didn't have, you didn't look like, you can look at us and tell. You know what I mean? So, you know, you didn't have friends. Nobody want to be around you. You're dirty. Probably didn't have a haircut. You know, you know your people. You know what I mean? So, I mean, my mom and dad were good parents, man. They were good parents. Very good parents. Loving, kept us together. They came from rough homes, but they were good parents. And that addiction, man, is, 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 is horrible. My mother has never changed since then. She has never been the same. My mom was so loving and soft and gentle and just so affectionate. After she did them drugs and she got off, she is so aggressive. She sold everything to us in offense. She's very more controlling. She just never was the same again. And I've never seen that soft side of her come out ever again. It's almost like she was stuck in a a, a place of, how you call it, uh, withdrawal. You ever see somebody when they go to withdraw and she's angry and agitated? That seemed like she's stuck there. She, she, and, 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 and I don't know, man. You know, I just pray for her. I love my mom to death. You know what I mean? She my heart. She all I know. She my right hand. When nobody there, she was there. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. You know, and, and during that time when you went to Michigan, was that during the time when you met Floyd? Exactly. And let me tell you something about that about that experience. First time I met him, they had a uh, it might have been a power tournament or some up there. So me being from Philadelphia, me being up there now, usually when you in the region, I know everybody in DC, my weight and the weight above. I know everybody in that area. That's my region. That's our region. We know that. So when I'm up there in that region, you know, it was a whole another different, different situation up there. The fighters, the way they look, the way they act, the way they dress, everything was just different. I'm at the power tournament, man, and it's huge. It's two rings, a lot of people. 
All of a sudden, I see this guy walk in with a fur mink, drip down, tall, dark skin guy, had two pretty ladies with him. I'm like, damn, Jerry. He had this little dude with him, and I'm a fighter. And I'm like, what the hell? This dude stops, man. The ladies grabs his jacket, and the other one opens the bag and hands him the mitts. Yo, this is a true story. <laughs> true story. And I'm looking at this like, and the other lady lays Floyd gloves up, and guess what? They got the. The damn mitt, the gloves on Floyd, and gave him the mitts. Him and Floyd got the. And let me tell you something about that. The whole place shut down. Was looking like, damn, what the hell are they doing? He stopped, put his jacket back on. The ladies put his jacket back on. He walked Floyd to the ring. Floyd went in there, mopped the floor with the ball, came back out, put his jacket on. And I'm looking at them like, wow, that was something I've never seen in my life. I ended up winning. The tournament, he won it. So, you know, they got to do a championship team picture. And every time a tournament came up, we both in the team picture, we became close. You see what I'm saying? Because all the winners, you got to do a team picture. Each weight class, whoever won at that weight class. You know what I mean? He was always one a bit, one above me. Now, that was the beginning of, that was the beginning of how we met. <laughs> you know, during that time, did, did, did you both have talks about what you were going through during that time? Like with your parents and what he was going through? Oh, all the time. time. Uh, all the time. All the time. I remember, I mean, you know, I remember we was kids, and I remember, you know, him and Nate Jones used to be together a lot, and he was so excited, kept telling me, listen, I got this new manager, man. His dad had got arrested. He wasn't there no more, so he didn't have that support. But he knew he had to stay on track. He met a guy named Don Hell from Grand Rapids, Caucasian guy, older, and he said he, and he bought Floyd a yellow Beretta. And Floyd was so excited, man. Oh, yo, I'm going to come up there, man. We're going to go out because I'm in Grand Rapids. I mean, he's in Grand Rapids. I'm in Marquette, Michigan. That's probably eight hours. It's a little ride. You know what I mean? They're not closing. There's a big difference in cities. Big difference. You know what I mean? So he got that. He got that. Uh, he got the car, man. And, you know, we was out. It was time. To, it was, he was out. You know what I mean? He couldn't tell us nothing, man. Couldn't tell us nothing. You know what I mean? Every tournament, we didn't win everywhere together, man. You know what I mean? Since kids, man. Everywhere. That was the reason I moved to Vegas. He called me, you know, at the Olympics, and he had, you know, Bob M offered us, you know, water spots out there for the signing bonus, gave us money, cars, whatever we needed. I said, I didn't want that. I'm going back to Philly. Give me the money. Add, give me more money. I'm out. Floyd, you know, he went up. It was a smart thing for him to do. What are you going to do? Go back to Grand Rapids? His dad wasn't around no more. His dad was arrested at the time. He took it. I went back to Philly. He called me a month later and says, man, where you at? I said, I'm in Philly. What's up? You got to come back. You got to come back, man. I said, wow, I got to come back. What's up? Man, this shit ain't right, man. I, ain't nobody out here but me, man. You know, he's a kid. He ain't in Las Vegas. It's not like, you know, as a kid, we even go in the, we talking about 19, 20. We just going to walk in the casino and, and you know exactly where to go and how to have fun. Nah, you, you want to go with, with a kid your age at. Anybody in the casinos got money and they gambling big money and they've been doing it for years. We ain't even 21 yet. I understand where you coming from. I'm on my way. Worst, one of the worst decisions I could have did and good because now I think. They just gave me, was just going to give me that. I told them, no, give me the money. Now the money they gave me wasn't equal value to that property or that car. Wow. So now I went back out there and then bought that over again. You see what I'm saying? One of those, one of those things, man, about, you know, when you're young and you don't have financial, financial literacy. We got there from boxing, not fighting. I mean, we got there from fighting, not reading. When you look at the NFL, the NBA, they got there by reading. So when they get to them money, them contracts, things, they understand what's going on. They're very well equipped to deal with what's going to happen. But when you get kids and you get these young men from the inner city that maybe not went to college, don't understand how to read, maybe. Don't understand a lot about finances. Don't understand about saving. Don't understand a lot about real estate. Maybe a lot of different things about business. They ill-equipped. But guess what? Those are the ones that they want. Those are the ones they're looking for. Well, all the talent and no brains. Because eventually, you got to remember this. When you begin to make more money, have more fights, they can steal and steal and steal. But if you keep winning, eventually, guess what's going to happen? You're going to realize what they've been stealing. So when you see that, they don't stay together even after success. What did I tell you? That the, that the, re, that the respect was bought. It wasn't earned. From the very beginning, it was never earned. You know what I mean? Exactly. What you know, speaking on that, you know, when you brought up the NFL, you know, to have so many different types of mentoring programs 
and, and something that you don't see in boxing. With that, will you talk about the financial literacy um, with the young boxers, uh, dealing with contracts and, and things of that nature? How, does, how can that change in the sport where it's really no governing body, per se? Well, I'm actually working on that right now, as you say. Literally, I'm working with a company. I signed the NDA. I can't do too much talking about it, but I just signed a company who's bringing the same qualities that a kid can get from the from 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 going to college, getting a scholarship. This company is offering scholarships to the inner city. They're going down there, making a difference with the inner cities, and going to take the inner city, develop them, and bring them the same way you go to to high school, middle. I mean, you go to middle school, high school, and college. They prepare you for that. In order for you to go to college, you got to have a certain stipulation where you got to be able to read right. You're gonna, and you got to, I mean, unless you got the money to pay and you just don't got no brains, you're going to keep paying your way. Okay, cool. But you got to have some kind of brains and understanding, some kind of drive to go to college. If not, at the high school, you don't care, you're not going to go, right? So this company is going to take that and they're going to feed, they're going to take them scholarships, give them to the kids. Breaking up a little bit. They're going to turn them amateur. They're going to give them opportunities from school, jobs. They're going to go into it, you know what I mean, and help them. Yeah, because it's going to help the inner city a lot, man, but it's going to feed into it. You know what I mean? I don't want to get into too much of it, but it's going to be huge, man. Because it's, it's very much needed because especially now in the sport of boxing where the fighters are, are getting younger and younger coming into the sport. So you asking 16 and 17-year-olds to be grown men and 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 be able to understand financial literacy, which most of them will not. Hey, and just have this. people around you who are taking advantage of you during that time. And you got to remember, when I got into boxing, I went to a recreation center, a PAL. These are the things, these nonprofit organizations is what helped me to get to where I'm at. These nonprofit, the inner city youth, yeah, that's where I come from. I identify with that. I identify with them. Somebody that's in a horrible position that they have no, they have no hand in the position that they're in. They just want to get out of it. And they want to give everything they got to get out of it. Those are the fighters I'm looking for. That's where I want, that's where I go out and find my next champion at. Those that want to give everything they got to change their life. I'm not looking for those that's looking, they're looking on Instagram and want to be like that. Nah, I'm not looking for that. Oh, you do 100 push-ups in, in, in 30 seconds? I'm not looking for that. You can run how fast? I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for those that got the mind to be successful. Success starts from within before you can grab it, before you can obtain it outside of yourself. You got to become it inside. A lot of kids don't understand that boxing is mental. It's spiritual. It's not just a fight sport. It's an art. And it has to be mastered. And first, you got to control the mind. If you can't control your thinking, then you're lost. You're just done. You destructed it already. You destroyed it already. You, you know, know that thinking of what if every time it's what if this bad happened or what if that bad happened or what if this bad happened? You lost. It's over. You're done. You got to have no shadow of a doubt that you're going to win. You are the best. You can't think no negativity at all of what if anything negative at all. It can't happen. It can't. That's not success. But when you're successful in the inside, then everything that comes out will emulate success. Positivity, a bright light, understanding, forgiveness, a godly love, a mari fati. It's just, it's just brilliant. You know what I mean? You it's know, speak, speaking of spirituality, man, how, how important was Islam in your faith during that time, during the troubled times? It was all I had. It was all I had. As a kid, when you're hungry and mommy's not there to feed you, but she gave me God. My mother and father gave me God. They gave me a higher power. They gave me an understanding of we are an energy having a physical experience. So whatever experience you want to experience, you can, you can project that, but it has to be mentally first. If you can envision what you want and envision it and actually envision it every day and you can live it, you can think it, you can literally vision it, it will happen. It will happen. The problem is a lot of people don't have to control their minds, so they think in the wrong things and don't understand that it's working against them. And then the same things keep happening. They don't understand why the same things happening over and over. They don't understand why. Because they're throwing it to themselves mentally. But if they thought about success like that, then in return, it, what will happen? That's what they're going to get back, what they're putting out. We're energy. We're energy. You know, g going back uh, to your amateur days, what was it like uh, traveling overseas? 
knowing you're an inner city kid from from North Philly and to see a whole different world. Yo, and and you know, I got friends, man, that's still in North Philly and never left out of North Philly. So for me to be that age and still go over to another country, not once, but I did the year after. I then went to London, England the year after that. But my point is, is being over there, you know one thing I noticed? It wasn't as racist. They weren't as racist. I didn't say they were not racist. I didn't say that. I said they weren't as racist. When I'm here, if I'm walking somewhere, like when I went up to that school in Marquette, man, you know, you talking about racial level level. You talking about in the 80s? The eight in the mid, late 80s? You know what I mean? If you think about how, how racism is now, you're looking at how things are happening out here with the police and everything's going on. Think about how bad, and they don't, you only see this because of cameras now, the internet. But imagine when you take those cameras away, what was going on? Worse. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? And I'm up there in the middle of that at, night, at, at 85 years old, but I can promise you this. I never thought, what if I die? What if I don't make it up there? What if I lose this fight? What if somebody kill me? What if, what if I get kidnapped? I didn't think none of that. I thought I got to change my life. I got to get to success. And I prayed every step of the way. <laughs> I prayed and I, and I had confidence. And I prayed, I fasted, and I prayed at a young age. At a young age. And that's that's... No, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. You got it. Now, I was going to ask you because during that time when you started to, to rise and rise and then you got to that point, how special was that 96 Olympic team and the camaraderie that you had? Remember, you got – I come from the era – I come from a gym that sent three individuals to the Olympics in one year. Terrence Crawford, David Reed, and myself. We was all on the same Olympic team. So when you come from, when you ask about a good trainer, a good coach, you got to find a one that got a system that works. How many gyms can you say that? I mean, we all came from the same place. I mean, that was extraordinary. We had a, we, and we had a close bond because we all been fighting since we was kids. David Reed was in Marquette, Michigan when I was there. You know what I mean? So we've been together. I mean, like, we grew up in the sport together. I mean, literally. And that team, man, the bond, it was, it was special, man. It was a special team for sure. We all, we all had a good bond, a good close. Antonio Tarver was, 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 was the old head. He was number one in the world going into the Olympics already. You know what I mean? So he was a big dog. Remember, he fought Roy Jones in the Olympics before that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, we see him like, oh, man, he the man. You know what I mean? We was kids. It was, it was a heck of an experience, man. And I enjoyed every bit of it. What's, what's the biggest thing you took away from that experience? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Sometimes we can get caught up in our own heads, man. and Too much of anything is not good. So if it takes 5,000 hours of doing anything to master it, and I kept believing and saying that I was the best so much that it affected me in a way that I begin to not stay focused. Then the money coming, being a kid, and so many distractions that you never had before. It was easy to stay focused when you don't got nothing to focus on. But when the distractions start coming, it, it begins to change the dynamics of things. You know what I mean? Now you got now the same girls that you used to like. Ah, they want you now. The same guys that you wanted to hang out with, you weren't cool enough. Oh, no, you the man now. You understand what I'm saying? Things change then. And now... It's, it's where your discipline really shows. When you talking about discipline, let me show you something. You see Floyd went to camp when he fought Diego Corrales. He went to training camp with his dad. He showed it. That ain't for him. That ain't for him. You know why? You look at fighters. If Floyd go to the strip club every day and be in there all night in the strip club, got a fight coming up in two months. He'd be in the strip club all night. Leave in the morning, go to sleep, Wake up, go to the gym, get something to eat, go to strip club. Leave the strip club, go running, go back to the strip club. <laughs> you do that. Listen, this is what he do every day. He can do that. Man, you say that's impossible. Why he do that? And that's wrong. But one thing I tell you this about Floyd, he can do that because his discipline is one hundred. You say, well, that's not discipline. That is discipline. Who do you? Who the hell do you know? can go around that much desire and still stay focused. You say, well, he ain't focused. No, he is focused. Well, why are you going to say he focused? He's doing what he enjoys and 
not just that he don't really enjoy, but he ain't drinking. He ain't smoking. He ain't destroying his body. He ain't just eating anything. Not saying he perfect. You know what I mean? But those things that are distracted or destructive, he can go around that, but he won't touch it because of his discipline. You know what I mean? For example, me, when I go in the club, I'm giving me a drink. Not now. I, I used to. I don't drink. I don't, you know, I don't mess around. But that's what I would do. And you said, wouldn't they? You know why? Because it came a time I would, they would say, yo, we want this 96 Olympia, the new guy in Philly. Come on to the clubs. I hear Ryan in here. Come on down. And it got to a point where I'm like, oh, maybe not today. All right, well, we're going to do this. And they compensate me. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go. But I'm not a very social person. I don't like being around people, especially crowds. You got to remember, when I was 12 years old, I was involved with a murder. I'm thinking they're trying to kill me now. Because somebody killed my brother, I'm coming from home. That affects me mentally. I don't like being in crowds. I don't like being around people. It ain't because I'm stuck up or I think I'm better. I just got issues. I don't like being around people. I don't. So what, guess what? I could use the compensation of the offense. Now, what do you think will happen next? Shoot. I don't want to be in here, man. I, you know, I'm nervous. I'm like, man, damn. I, you know what I mean? And call everybody to come down. I don't want to call nobody to come down. If I call friends, it's going to be a wild party. I don't want to do nothing. Like that. But that's exactly what happened. Because the only way for me to stay there, I had to drink. I had to drink and calm me down. One drink turned into two and said, oh, man, you ain't got to pay me. I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Turn up, man. Forget that, man. This is, matter of fact, the club is corny, man. I'm going to the strip club, man. I, I don't see enough in there. You know what I mean? It, 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 and that's made from one thing to another two. You know what I mean? But, hey, it was an experience, right. man. You know, one of the things you just talked about was discipline. And, and with that being said, you said, you know, 5,000 hours to master uh, a certain skill. You know, I had a conversation with uh, Keith Holmes one time, and he talked about the lost art of fundamentals in boxing with these uh, kids today. Do you find that to be true? Let me ask you this question. You know this, right? That nobody's going to willingly say, I'm going to dedicate my life to boxing. I'm 10 years old, and my dad is saying, Dedicate your life to boxing because you know what? They got a 401k. They give you full medical. They're going to take care of you, make sure your whole financial life is set forth. Yes, let's do that. Unfortunately, none of that is possible in boxing. If you don't have anything or any understanding, nobody around you to protect your man is over with. It's a wrap from the gate if you don't have financial literacy. You know what I mean? Now, I just got off the subject real quick. What was the question again? <laughs> Oh, the fundamentals of boxing is that okay? So yeah, boxing? right back to that. I'm sorry. If I go to when I when I came to when I went to Georgia, I go to a boxing gym. I'm like, yeah, you know, I got 35 years of, of consistent experience. My last fight was five years ago. When I started, went into the gym, I wasn't going to the gym for myself no more to train for a fight. I began to go in there to train other people, and that's another story I like to touch on because it messed me. It messed with me psychologically. But when you talk about training, like going to a gym, you gotta remember this. I have not seen a fighter in a gym training nobody. I see people who want to make money and opens a gym for a business. So if I go in there and this or gym owner is identifying my gifts and who I am, do you know what's going to happen? They're going to lose that fighter. They're going to lose their money. So any gym I go to, guess what? I'm kryptonite. They don't want to be around. You know why? Because it's about the money. Now, remember this. If they, if they boxed before and they was authentic about making champions, you know what they would say? Yo, let me talk to you about that experience you got. Because there's not too many people walking around with that experience you got. Because there's not too many people willing to sacrifice their life in a sport that has nothing to offer. You don't see most fighters going back training their own sons. So why don't you see a whole slew of fighters in the gym training? Fighters. Why you don't see it? Because the only reason why they went to the gym in the first place because they had nowhere else to go. They got options now. Why go back to it? Why? But here it is, I'm me. Here it is, me. Oh, humble me. They don't respect it. They don't. But guess what? That's okay because I'm not supposed to be everywhere with everybody. Those that are special, that understand, they're going to be drawn to me. I don't look for them. If I, and let me tell you, this is an example I got. I, I train dogs. So if I say, man, I want to buy these two dogs right here, right? So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them a test. I don't feed them for five days. I put a steak in the plastic bag. I drop it on the ground. I put the leash on the dog, and I walk by that steak with the dog. The first dog, he ate the, 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 he ate the plastic bag and the steak. He ain't ate in five days. The other dog, I walk him by it. He kept walking right by it, right by it. Why would I waste my time? 
Yeah, because he ain't hungry. Why would I wish? He don't want it. Why would I wish?